Parking lots are one of the most uninspiring things to come out of modern urban infrastructure. These huge swaths of pavement are dedicated to one purpose only, and that is parking cars. Okay. It's not gonna make this one. So why is it that something so common and so simple can suck so bad? So right off the bat, let's get it out of the way here. Parking lots are not all bad, okay? I'll admit that. They're good for doing donuts in the snow and making out in the back of your 1999 Toyota Corolla when you're 17 years old. But other than that, I don't think many of us can think of a lot of good memories that we have associated with parking lots. But that's not surprising, as you will learn by the time this video is over. Okay, so this footage is of a mall nearby where I live, and believe it or not, this building was the collaborative outcome of engineers, architects, planners, interior designers, lawyers, marketers, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, just to get me in the door to buy stuff. But the only way that I can get to those stores is by navigating this disaster. Believe I, you might be saying, surely this parking lot here is designed by, you know, thoughtful people who are architects. This place that resembles a dystopian nightmare that was plucked from some drunk community college dropout sad little sketchbook is actually 5D thinking of the highest order. Levi, parking lot design is ugly because it's been perfected. The best and the brightest minds in traffic studies have created a uniform series of requirements that render end users with a, wow, admittedly ugly, safe and functional final product. Right? 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 Wrong. In fact, while there are some parking lots that are thoughtfully designed by engineers with different types of plans and perimeters, we will get into that in a bit, most parking lots are just applied arbitrarily based on whatever rules they're supposed to follow to meet legal requirements. So this video is about why parking lots, due to a combination of neglect and indifference on the part of planners and engineers and architects, suck and how that complete suck is contributing to accidents, injuries, death, and just old plain urban sprawl and ugliness. Okay, so right off the top, we are not going to be making a video today about mandatory parking minimums. If you're one of those urbanist nerds who are here to talk about that, don't worry, we'll mention it, but that's not what this is about. We do have to say though, that we have enough parking. In Canada, where I live, we actually have too much parking. According to research done in 2021, there are 3.2 to 4.4 parking spots for every vehicle in this country. The study found that 40% of those spaces were for residential use, like outside of your house. 26 were connected to commercial and institutional sectors, parking lots, and the rest were on-road spaces. Now, obviously those parking spots are not evenly distributed and the spots in cities are harder to come by than those in the sticks. And as a result, where parking is made in cities, it is very expensive and stressful. And in the suburbs, where it is technically free, it is still stressful. This means that the perceived problems of parking are actually an issue of entitlement, not demand. We have this expectation today in North America that when we go to a store, we should have free parking right in front of the shop we wanna to go to. But here's the thing, a single parking space is usually eight feet wide by 16 feet long, and they can get bigger than that. And so even early on in the days of the motor vehicle, we knew that where we were going to put these things was going to be an issue. And here we are 100 years later, and it still is. So how do we solve it? Well, we did what we do with most problems. We came up with a list of rules that would hopefully make it better. The problem with parking is that the rules or the regulations that we came up with don't actually solve the problem and they actually make it worse. Our solution seemed simple at the time. We just won't let the number of cars outpace the number of spaces that we have to put them. For those of you familiar with urban planning, once again, you know what we're talking about. These are the mandatory minimums that you were waiting for us to mention. These are exactly what they sound like for those of you who are not studying geography in university. They are rules that state that if you are building a home or a business, you must ensure that there is enough parking for the customers or the residents that use it, which makes sense, kind of, but not really. 
It is this rule, combined with the sheer size of cars and their respective parking spots that they require, that has led to some of the most impressive wastes of space ever created. See, the thing is, when you are legally mandated to provide parking, you're essentially building your community around the cars that you drive there. For example, according to Henry Grabar, if the World Trade Center were built today, it would require a parking lot 20 blocks long. In another ridiculous case, Matt Farah, who owns a business offering specialty storage for luxury and collectible cars, was required to build an underground parking garage for his parking garage, which literally doubled the cost of his building. Now listen, I understand that if you're a red-blooded American and you're lifting Chevy Tahoe, this line of thinking feels a little academic. You park in parking lots all the time and it's fine. Well, according to a study by Deloitte, it's not fine. Americans on average spend 17 hours a year looking for parking, resulting in a cost of $345 per driver in wasted time, fuel, and emissions. This number jumps when you go to major centers. Drivers in New York spend 107 hours annually looking for parking, resulting in over $2,000 in annual costs per driver. I'm getting so mad about this for some reason. <laughs> I'm walking here, I'm walking here. Parking lots are also among the worst places, ironically, to have your car. 20% of accidents happen there and 9% of collision deaths happen when drivers reverse without looking and hit a pedestrian. NBC News says that around 2,000 kids under the age of 14 were injured in parking lot accidents in 2007 and 99 children died. The reason that parking lots are such a hotspot for collision and pedestrian injury specifically is because the parking lot is where we can't separate cars from people. Most parking lots today don't have sidewalks or designated walkways to get from your car to the storefront that you're going to, and so you're forced to walk behind cars that are backing up or just in the middle of the roadway. And this is all made worse because of how parking lots are laid out in North America. Look at this parking lot from a mall just down the road from me. You come in off of the highway into the parking area where you're forced to drive in front of all of the stores before turning up and driving past all the parking spots until you find one. This means that everyone who wants to get to the store has to cross this lane of traffic to get there. Look, I'm not an urban planner. I did take a geography degree, but I'm not a genius. Could this mess not be easily avoided if we just had the road go to the back of the parking lot? and then just have parking go all the way up to the front so you don't have to cross that road? It turns out that the inventor of the mall, who inadvertently invented the first parking lots also, had the same idea. Gruen wanted his parking lot to feature mixed-use housing, green spaces, and all sorts of pro-human things that modern parking lots just don't have at all. Gruen actually hated cars, literally once saying that their threat to human life and health is just as great as the exposed sewer and he designed his parking lots with long promenades to encourage walking. But to top all of this off, because, you know, we didn't need any more reasons to hate parking lots, they're terrible for the planet. They create so-called heat islands in cities, amplifying and exacerbating the effects of climate change. They also worsen floods, as the vegetation and soil that was cleared away to make way for you to park your car means that there's nothing there to absorb flood and rainwaters. And worse yet, across North America, parking lots are increasingly being built on agricultural land, which is uh, where we grow food normally. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather be able to eat than be able to park my car somewhere. And this is where we come down to what I call the Stockholm parking syndrome. At this point in the video, hopefully you've realized that parking sucks and that if we were all in full control of our faculties as adults, we would like to do away with them if possible. But the problem is that we've kind of screwed ourselves. See, creating more spaces to park doesn't reduce traffic, it creates it. More parking lots and more parking spaces means more distance in between destinations, which means that you need a car more than ever to get to where you need to park, and so on and so forth. What you end up with is the sprawl that we see so commonly across Canada and the US. By reducing the walkability and the bikeability and the accessibility by transit of any particular location, you're basically making it impossible to get there by any other means than the car itself. And what happens when we're stuck with only one option? People take advantage. 
Parking has become a huge business. Author Henley Grabar literally wrote the book about it in Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World. Hilariously, it turns out the parking lots result in a huge amount of revenue for unexpected businesses. Airports, for example, make the majority of their money on parking. To the extent that Grabar says that they could be more accurately described as a parking business with a side hustle in aviation. Also, um, why are we paying for parking at hospitals? Just a, just a side rant that I don't even have time for right now in this video. Ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Ah, 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 staying alive. But one thing we do have time for is privately owned parking lots because they somehow make this shitty situation even worse somehow. These corporate pavement slumlords are able to completely make up their own rules. By far, the most expensive rates that you will ever pay for parking is going to be at a private lot. And they are the ones who are hiring the National Guard of towing companies to make sure that the single mom's minivan gets towed while she's trying to buy diapers. They're also known to charge obscene fines whenever they can get away with it. One Kelowna nurse was bullied into paying hundreds of dollars in parking tickets by a private parking company only to find out legally she didn't have to pay any of them. The news agency that reported on the story found that private companies actually have no right to charge you obscene amounts of money for going over your parking time. Keep in mind though that you do have to pay municipal parking tickets, They're, that's a different thing. So, all right, you're saying Levi, I live in a place where I need, I need a car and I need to park my car. So is there any future worth living in where this is the reality? Don't worry, I'm with you. I own a car, I park a car, and I am also wondering that question. Of course, there are parking options that could be a lot better. Most of the ways that we could improve parking is by stacking the cars on top of each other above the ground or below the ground. And while this seems like it might be a great solution, it usually isn't. Where's the car? Well, I, I thought it was here. You don't know where we parked? The great hope, according to Grabar again, was that parking garages would become similar to train stations, hubs of commerce and bustle. But the reality is that parking garages have become more associated with annoyance, crime, and shady political conspiracies. The reality is that putting cars above or below ground just costs a lot of money. So it only really works in places where people are super rich or land prices are high enough to justify the cost. Today, robots will actually park your car for you in places like China, Germany, and Japan. These futuristic garages are super neat, but sadly, they don't really solve the problem because they're expensive and uncommon. There are some AI experts that say that parking lots will eventually just disappear as driverless cars take over the roads. These experts think that the internet of things will become so efficient at communicating with your driverless car that it'll be able to run a side hustle Ubering job, taking people around town and then come back and pick you up when you've finished watching your movie or whatever. Now, listen, I love a cool piece of tech as much as the next guy, but inventing autonomous vehicles that may or may not solve our transportation issues feels like a weird and expensive choice when we have simpler and safer technology that has already been proved to solve the problem. The real hope that we all have to keep pushing for here is that cities promote busing and biking and walking so that the convenient thing is not driving and therefore parking becomes less popular and more accessible for the people who really do need it. But until then, we're stuck with these ancient design disasters and we'll just keep getting frustrated in parking lots until then. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you wanna see me rant about more stuff related to our consumer world, make sure that you're subscribed and we'll see you in the next one.